our studio in New York City. I'm Julie Hyman alongside Josh Lipton, and this is Yahoo Finance Live. Here's what we're watching this afternoon. Markets on edge to start the final full trading week of the year. Tech stocks outperforming as optimism over interest rate cuts drive some key names higher in today's trade. We've got a look at what is driving that action. And we're taking a closer look at the flurry of M&A activity. Deals getting done and dropped. U.S. Steel finally finds a buyer and Adobe calling off its $20 billion deal to acquire Figma. What it all means heading into the new year straight ahead. Plus, a patent dispute forcing Apple to take some watches off the shelves. The stock is under pressure on the news, which you need to know if you were planning to put one under someone's Christmas tree. Hint, hurry up. <laughs> Let's get you up to speed on the market action at this hour on this Monday um, after we have seen a streak of wins for the major averages. Today we are seeing, at least for the day, that streak continue. The Dow trading higher by 27 points. Remember, it's at a record again if it closes higher today. The S&P 500 up about 25. That's good for a gain of a half of 1% and the NASDAQ up uh, almost three quarters of 1%. Communication services leading the pack once again today. But guess what's coming up in number? The second uh, spot here is consumer staples. Energy stocks also doing well. So it's kind of a hodgepodge, not as thematic necessarily as we have seen in recent days. Yep. Interesting, too, because you saw kind of some Fed officials throwing some cold water. Yes. Remember that? I mean, the cuts are coming, so maybe investors looking through that a bit, do we think? Maybe. Maybe it's just getting close to the holidays and also people are doing reason. These, their end of year window dressing or yeah. sort of rebalancing of portfolios, perhaps. Another good reason. Perhaps. Our top story, meanwhile, today, we're going to dig into a number of deal announcements. More than $40 billion worth of M&A was announced today. That's according to Bloomberg. Highlights include that $14 billion takeover of U.S. Steel by Nippon Steel. Gene Sequency Machine Company Illumina, meanwhile, selling its cancer test developer Grail for $7 billion. And on the other side, Adobe abandoning its $20 billion acquisition of divine design software company Figma. So where to begin, Julie? A lot of headlines. Why don't we Deals begin getting with, done, not yeah. getting done. Yeah, I mean, and that $40 billion uh, also accounts for stuff that is not necessarily the top of the top in terms of our headlines, say Coke Industries making an acquisition of a fertilizer business, for example. I think we should start with the steel deal because yeah. it is quite an interesting one. And I guess started an up note here with this 122-year-old company. Iconic company. Right, yeah. getting taken out by a Japanese steel giant. Yeah, and there was some back and forth here. So by the way, this would be a big deal. From what I'm reading, this would be, if it gets done here, this would be the biggest steel company outside of China. So right. this is big. Of course, U.S. Steel, the backstory, you know, had been thinking over these pot potential transactions for some time, rejected that offer from rival Cleveland Cliffs, and the board at U.S. Steel clearly thought, you know what, I think we can do better. And they could, And as they it did do better, out. as yeah. it turns out. Nippon, biggest steel producer in Japan, moves in, will pay 55 in cash. Yeah, there are some interesting wrinkles here. I mean, I think the, the buildup to the deal getting done is interesting, to your point. Um, you have to ask the question, given the other stories we're going to get to today if there's going to be any regulatory yeah, scrutiny here. What's interesting is the United Steelworkers Union is calling for scrutiny of the deal. They had favored Cleveland Cliffs, which is another union shop, um, to combine with U.S. Steel, but ultimately uh, they could not get that deal done. So we'll see if the union does end up uh, putting enough pressure on regulators here to take a look at this deal. And sticking with regulators, yes. so then Adobe and Figma terminate their $20 billion deal. And the basic bottom line was the company just said, listen, there's no clear path here to getting the green light, right? From regulators from the EU and the UK's CMA. Seeing Adobe quoted as saying in reports here that the CMA's proposed remedies were disproportionate. This was a big bet by Adobe. And the company did just report earnings last week. Right. We didn't hear anything at that point, but they dropped this headline today. Yeah, and last week they got punished a little bit because they did not meet sort of the loftiest projections from analysts as to um, how they were going to do in the coming year. So what is this going to mean for Adobe? It's going to have to pay a billion dollar termination fee. That's what they had agreed to. The CEO, Shantana Narayan, saying uh, the companies disagree with the rulings on the parts of regulators, but they think it's in the best interest. What I thought was interesting is the almost unanimity, unanimity yeah. of, uh, of analysts who say, Good riddance. Exactly. It's a relief yeah. that this it is, is interesting. that this yeah. a decision has been come to, and they're going to not go through with this. There had been 
um, again, not universal, but broad, the broad view that Adobe made might have been overpaying for Figma. So I think that's part of the relief that's being expressed here. In fact, here. Bar Barclays goes to an overweight on the name, by the way. In fact, the deal and implied dilution they told their clients had kept on the sidelines. So they actually saw that headline as kind of a positive catalyst, a reason to move in. Yeah, and then yeah. finally, just quickly here on Illumina, um, because we do want to get to a broader look at the markets. Illumina went ahead and made an acquisition that seemed to be kind of panned by regulators. Mm -hmm. There was a whole activist campaign from Carl Icahn that eventually, in part, ended up costing CEO Francis D'Souza his job um, at Illumina. Now Illumina says, never mind. Icahn basically said, you blew money on right, this. Exactly. Right, exactly. Yeah. So we don't exactly know how much Illumina is going to get for Grail. We don't know how they're going, who they're going to sell it to, how they're going to spin it off, but they said they're getting rid of it. And again here, relief on the part of investors sure. who had seen this as an overhang. All right, let's broaden it out here and talk about the Federal Reserve's pivot toward rate cuts last week, surprising markets and driving stocks sharply higher. Our next guest says the position to take in the new year, though, is defense. Joining us now, Evercore ISI's Julian Emanuel. I mean, the, the market right now seems to be offense all the way, Julian, and seem to see uh, Chair Powell's comments really as the green light to do that. Why do you think maybe not so fast here? So we do think, again, if you think about it, it has been a fantastic year in the last month and a half. Uh, and there are a couple things going on here. This has been a, a strange cycle. I think everyone would freely admit that in, in a lot of ways, the market's been uh, somewhat unusual ever since the pandemic. Uh, but for us, when you think about how strong consensus was at the end of 2021, that growth stocks would lead 2022. And when you think about how strong consensus was at the end of 2022, that value stocks would lead, that multiples would compress forever, and that we were going to have an imminent recession, you see that the last two years, strong consensus has really been uh, upended. And from our point of view, what the Fed did last week was solidify consensus to the point of near unanimity that there would be a soft lending. Now, that's not ever core ISI's base case. We think there's going to be a mild recession next year. But the point being is that you've really fully priced in the soft landing to where the if there's any news that's adverse at all, we do think stocks are vulnerable. And one other thing I'd point out, as offensive a day as today appears to be, if you look at the two leading sectors, communication services, and lo and behold, consumer staples, so there is a subtext of rotation that's going on in the markets that we think is going to continue into 2024. So uh, um, Julian, if, if your firm's call then is for a recession next year, so 12 months from now, Julian, what's your, what's your target for the SPX, the S&P 500, if we're at 47.45 right now? So our year end target is 47.50. So it, essentially it's one of those ones where you may wake up and, and you see that there, there's no movement which frankly, if you go back and you go back to January of 2022 and you woke up today, you would almost say nothing's happened in the last two years because the indices are basically right where they were in January 2022. Um, but to us, again, it's the tale of a bit too much enthusiasm right now, likely tempered by either a downturn or frankly, uh, with as much as been priced in, we need to be cognizant of the fact that even if we somehow manage to skirt a recession, the average uh, peak to trough drawdown in a non-recession year is 13%. And it just to us seems as if uh, this pricing for perfection doesn't really account for any of the risks uh, on both growth, inflation, and geopolitics, which we are be about to be reminded of uh, directly into the new year. Um, let's talk a little bit more about that wild card, if you will, because it's not just geopolitics, it's U.S. politics that's going to come more into the fore in the new year, as you talked about a little bit in your note. What are your concerns? What are the risks posed by the U.S. presidential race? So the first thing is, is we went back and, and we looked at history, and what we noticed was that when you had years where congressional control was as what we call tight, that's 10 or fewer seats in the House and two or fewer seats in the Senate. What we saw was the election year was immensely volatile. Five out of the eight years this has happened were down. 
two of the three years that were up actually had recession. So the good news for us is that even though we think there's likely to be uh, a mild recession, it doesn't preclude the market from going higher at the uh, by the end of the year. But what it does say that, you know, the, the, the ride that investors have had in 2023 has been relatively smooth. That's not what we should be expecting next year. And so Julian, so if I, if I, if I agree, I'm listening to you right now, I'm an equity investor, I agree with your call, it makes sense to me, well, how you're thinking about the economy, the markets. What, what, what sectors, Julian, do I wanna be in in the stock market? What look attractive you here? What looks constructive in 2024? So again, as, as Julie pointed out in, in the beginning, Josh, is we prefer defense, but over the long sweep of history, defense can have certain different connotations. We looked at the time from the last Fed hike to the, the first cut, and again, the market believes that it may be uh, March. We think it's more like June. Uh, and, and frankly, you've had outperformance in consumer staples, in uh, healthcare, and communication services. And it's interesting that communication services is defensive even in a recession because you're going to get ad spend on both the election and the Olympics. Consumer staples is has not been able to quote unquote bank any of the benefits of declining input costs. Remember, commodity prices have been down substantially uh, the last several months, uh, as well as the benefit of yields coming off. And in healthcare, uh, to us, the story is really an immunity to geopolitics and interest rate fluctuations and a diminution in labor input pressures. So all of those really do say defense does win in 2024. And that's interesting. I like the reframing of what defense means. Julian, finally, I kind of want to start where you began, which is looking back at 2021 and what people projected for 2022, looking back at 22, what people predicted for 23 and what they got wrong. What are you most concerned about getting wrong going into next year? Where's What's the biggest risk there? Well, look, you get, given our call uh, that the first half is likely to have a downside bias, the strength of the tape uh, right now would tell us that the biggest risk to us is that markets just keep going. But again, this is one of these things where like when you think about it, right, there has only ever been one quote unquote soft landing in history. That was 1995. And from our point of view, the valuation uh, jump off point, uh, particularly uh, as far as growth and technology is concerned, which has been the leadership, uh, throughout 2023, it's it's a much different jump off point. So, so uh, you know, could the market keep going? Absolutely. Uh, but again, to us, the risk reward for that being something that occurs is, is really sort of, you know, far out there, something that we don't think is, uh, is something that the investors are our best off position. Julian, great to catch up with you as always. Thanks so much for spending some time with us. Julian Emanuel of nice. Evercore ISI, thank you. Well, some of the biggest yeah. moves in the market today are in the commodity space. Ines Ferre is here with the details on that story. Hi, Ines. Hi, Julie. And what we've seen today is a bump for WTI for crude oil. Let's take a look at the chart so you can see where we're at with WTI and crude both jumping more than 2% during today's session. This is after British oil giant BP said that it was pausing ship shipments via the Red Sea after Houthi rebels were attacking ships. This was a precautionary pause. But look, several shipping companies have been uh, pausing their shipments, including including Evergreen, that's a global container shipping company. Now the Red Sea, that's connected to the Mediterranean Sea by the Suez Canal. Anywhere between 12 and 15% of oil is transported via the Suez Canal. So it is a very important area that's connecting, uh, that is a shipping route connecting Europe to Asia. Uh, one analyst saying that if you have one week of meaningful capacity rerouting could have a ripple effect for several months ahead when it comes to oil. And that's why we saw the bump up in oil prices today. Now, over the last six days, we have seen oil rising higher. Part of that has to do with the 
weaker dollar, which uh, uh, and also the Federal Reserve uh, hinting perhaps at rate cuts next year. So you saw a little bit of a rally when it came to crude prices. Uh, but overall, if we are taking a look at a year to date chart, we are seeing that year to date crude is in negative territory. One other note also, guys, is we have been also watching natural gas prices and natural gas prices, which have been on a decline uh, over the last couple of months. Well, the, those today saw a bump up, and that is because of the expectation of some colder weather ahead, guys. Inez Ferre, thank you so much, Inez, for that. Appreciate it. Yeah. Now let's get to some trending tickers. Shares of Apple trading just slightly lower. That's today after announcing the company will halt U.S. sales of the Apple Watch Series 9 and Ultra 2. The stoppage due to an ongoing patent dispute. So this, Julie, is the issue here is the International Trade Commission, the ITC, ruling that Apple violates Massimo patents and would need to halt, device, halt sales of the devices. And specifically, this is all about patents related to the watch app that's calculating blood oxygen mm -hmm. saturation. I was checking today with um, Gene Munster over at Deepwater Acid Management. Gene is a you know, well-known, well-respected Apple analyst. Here's why you care about this, he said, because by his math, the Series 9 and the Ultra 2 generate at this point the vast majority of the company's watch sales right now. Um, as you know, Remember, Apple doesn't break out the watch segment. Gene thinks it accounts for about 5% of total company revenue. Now, bottom line, is it a big deal or no deal? Munster take is this, ugly headline that gets fixed in the next two months. Either Apple Apple wins, he says, on appeal, or Apple pays up. And if they pay up, Munster argues it's a non-event. We'll see. Well, and the question is, if you were going to buy an Apple Watch for yourself or for your loved one for the holidays, do you rush out now and get one? So are those sales eliminated or just Delayed. deferred yeah. or even brought forward, right. right? It looks like people, according to 9to5Mac, which I believe first reported this, it looks like people will be able to buy it, what, until 3 p.m. Eastern on Thursday. Um, and that um, after that's online and that they have until December 24th to get the inventory that's in store. So they they still have a little bit of time. Yeah. We'll see what happens with the flow of the orders based Watch upon it. that. Yes. Let's talk about VF Corp as well. Those shares have been tumbling today after the company announced a recent cyber attack may affect its holiday sales. Now remember, we have been telling you about this new SEC cyber attack uh, rule that just went into effect today. And it basically says that companies that determine that a cyber attack is going to have a material effect, that has cost them money, have to report that finding within four days. Not the cyber attack within four days, but the realization or the finding that it's gonna be material. So it looks like VF is the first that technically falls in this window. There have been certainly companies that have been um, you know, doing this in anticipation of this uh, rule going into effect. But VF says it, it, it doesn't know yet how much it's going to cost it, but it is having effect on its ability to fulfill orders at this time. Yeah, and it's a rough time for this to happen too, right? I yeah. mean, remember they pulled their fiscal 24 guidance when they reported uh, back in late October. CEO Bracken Darrell is pretty new on the job. He was just appointed to that role over the summer. They do have this, you know, this plan in place, Julie, trying to address some of these challenges, improve normal North America, turn around the Vans brand, reduce, you know, fixed costs and leverage. But this headline and its ripple effects right now during the holidays is just it's brutal. And remember, there's an activist at work here. Engage Capital has a stake in the company and has been pushing for changes as well. Just yeah. to add to another yep. thing going on. And final ticket here, let's check out shares of SunPower. They are sinking today. That's after breaching terms in a credit agreement and raising doubts the company will be able to stay in the business. And you can see the reaction there down about 30% in today's trade. So this is obviously the rooftop solar company. Couple headlines. One, just reading through reports, say so it sounds like a subsidiary, Julie, defaulted under its credit agreement. Mm -hmm. And if SunPower's lender, it sounds like, wants immediate repayment, the company apparently wouldn't have enough liquidity to meet those obligations. Yeah, a couple of things about SunPower. Um, it is um, owned by Total Energies, the big French energy giant. So just something to note there. But solar has been such an interesting area recently um, because uh, it largely stock-wise has gotten a bump very recently from the drop in rates, which is seen as more beneficial for the industry because a lot of these projects are financed, right? Yep. Um, but it has been a rough year 
for solar, there have been some allegations from short sellers for uh, not, not Sun Power itself, but companies like Sunrun from the likes of Carson Block over at Muddy Waters, that the company's uh, accounting is a little bit of hinky. I mean, a little bit hinky. What these companies do is because of tax credits that homeowners can get for installing rooftop panels, there have been questions raised about how they're accounting on their own balance sheets for those tax credits. So that's something that's kind of affected not just Sunrun, which again was the company targeted by Block, but the industry more broadly. And there's just been enormous volatility, whether you're talking about these companies, Sonova, SolarEdge, um, TAN is a is the ETF, which I always enjoy the ticker of, um, Invesco, the Invesco um, uh, ETF that tracks this industry. But you can see all of them are down in today's session, as is that solar ETF. Yeah, I think the money quote from SunPower here was, as such substantial doubt exists about the company's ability to continue as a going concern. Right. That's your headline. That's ex That explains why you nosedive 30%. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, we're just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up, Roku is edging lower today after a downgrade at Seaport Research, the second in two days, by the way. We're going to dig into the details with the analyst who made the call later in the show. And the sentencing of Trevor Milton, founder of EV company Nikola, will have team coverage of the judge's decision. Plus, after the break, we'll be joined by StockTwit CEO Rishi Khanna, where we reveal the top five most active stocks on that platform in 2023. We've got all that and more when Yahoo Finance returns. More Americans are investing than ever before. 58% of U.S. households owned stocks in 2022, and that's up from nearly 53% in 2019, pre-COVID. That's according to the Federal Reserve's Survey of Consumer Finances. And investors are seeing big gains this year. The S&P 500 up around 23% as we head now into the holidays. Here to dig into some of the biggest moves in equities this year is Rishi Khanna, CEO of Stock Twits. Rishi, it is great to see you. Great to see you guys. Maybe to start with you, just interested, what are um, your users talking about right now on the platform? What is interesting them? Is it stocks, meme stocks, 
crypto, yeah. what, are the, what are the top tickers? So obviously the resurrection of crypto has been a big thing over the last uh, few weeks or months, uh, kind of. So you're seeing that reflected by the conversation around crypto itself, as well as companies like Mara, uh, Digital Holdings, right? Marathon Digital Holdings. Um, but also like, thematically you see a big interest in electric vehicles um, and all the stocks kind of related to that. Obviously Tesla, the original meme stock, is always a perennial leader, but companies like Mullen uh, Automotive, NIO, uh, Fisker, Rivian, et cetera, right? So thematically, that's an interesting space. Uh, AI, right? Like, you can't get away from 2023 <laughs> without talking about AI as much as like we might try, and it'll be interesting to see how that goes forward. Um, and then, you know, the Magnificent Seven, right? They are uh, the leaders, if you look at our kind of top five, top 10 lists, the Magnificent Seven are there across activity, interest, you know, gaining new followers and stuff. So um, really, you know, a breath thematically as well as kind of like a reflection of the markets as a whole. Mm. Yeah, I was really interested in that um, Fed data that we quoted that said more than half of people now own stocks yeah. in the U.S. that I think 21% of them own single stocks or they're direct investing in stocks, which is a record high. Yeah. I was really struck by that because those are the people who were then coming on Stockwitz or Yahoo Finance yeah. and, and looking up information. What do you think is propelling that interest? Yeah, so I mean, I do think you know the foundational catalyst of bringing a lot of people in the markets has been what's happened over the last you know three four years due to COVID and stuff. But now, I mean, I think getting exposure to the markets and understanding like following companies, whether it is a personal thematic interest, right? Like, you know, again, you see themes like cannabis, um, psychedelics, that world. You see themes like EVs and like, you know, whatnot. But, you know, biotech and drugs are another thing. So I think, you know, that personal interest, but also people understanding exposure to single stock names are an opportunity, right? An opportunity to make money and make gains. Hey, if you're in the queues, or lose money. <laughs> or lose money. I mean, Sorry. like, listen, it goes both ways, yeah. right? But, but you know, would you have rather been in Spy or in Nvidia this year, right? Like, and and right. Nvidia is not a small cap company, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, the interesting thing that the data shows you, and I don't know that people surface this, but like, like media and like music and like you know, Netflix came out with their report. Stocks since the demise of commissions, right, and commissions and trading, and so I think the stocks in these products move like digital products essentially. So the distribution is very much a power law. Like if you look at our data, it is a perfect clean power law uh, graph where you have the magnificent seven and the big guys that are up front, but the long tail of interests in, in names and stocks reflect like the variety of interests of like, you know, regular like everyday investors. In, in terms of themes and topics, which yeah. you mentioned, you know, AI, yeah. EVs, crypto, were there any that kind of surprised you this year that generating interest? Um, that surprised me, you know, yeah. not, not so much. I mean, I think, you know, there is always the interest that is, you can't kind of predict. Like, I mean, EV is something I've been talking about for a couple of years because we see the data and we see like a lot of interest fundamentally. But you do see like the interest in companies that have catalysts like bankruptcies, but they're big brand names, right? Like Bed Bath & Beyond is an example of that. And so, you know, the spikes of interest in those types of companies or like catalysts for like short interest, you know, GameStop, I think, really made people pay attention to things like short interest in the retail community. And so you do see those spikes, which are less predictable. But I think, you know, thematically, EVs have dominated, AI I see being, you know, I think we'll find out is it, you know, a fad or for real, like in 2024, mm -hmm. um, across like all these companies and whatnot, but. I can't stop, stop looking at Mullen when it keeps coming up as the number one. Right? It has been a disaster. It's a penny stock. So like, I hope that the people who were looking it up aren't buying and hold investors in that thing. Right, so I, uh, that's a great, and, and Mullen's been a fascinating ride, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, it's become, you know, the question draw management and like all those, you know, kind of issues that have surfaced over this last year especially. Um, but it's been three years running that it's been a top Two top, you know, top two stock, three years running, uh, you know, makes AMC and GameStop kind of look silly almost in a way, like, which is kind of interesting. But um, I think the passion, like EV is one of these spaces that is really a cult. Like, I mean, like, and it is, like Elon Musk started this, right? Like Tesla is the ultimate meme stock, cult stock. Fisker has a similar following, right? Mullen has a similar following. Rivian has a similar following. Uh, you know, you have Lord, right? And, and not to say these are good, like, hey, some of them have real cars, right. some of them don't, right? <laughs> um, but it is a, like, the, the deep passion, and like, you know, some of it is just social media doing social right. media things. Some of it is people like just fundamentally believe like, hey, the world is wrong about this, they're gonna come back. Um, and you know, more times than not, they're wrong, but 
every now and then, you know, people get that lottery ticket right. I mean, biotech's the same way. Let yeah, me ask you, um, I'm interested, you, you mentioned Musk. Yeah. Is X, I would imagine X is a place, a platform where people were talking yeah. stocks, meme stocks, yeah. crypto. Is that is that still true today? Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely, right? I mean, they are, they are a much larger platform, right, than us and stuff. And so they absolutely garner that conversation. I think the difference is, you know, when you're a generalist platform like an X or, you know, the Reddits of the world and stuff, you know, you can't necessarily focus on giving the tools and information and data around the context of the conversation, right? So, you know, for us, we have the opportunity to provide context, whether it's in the form of all the, you know, kind of news about the company or the fundamental data or the technical data, um, but then also, you know, our own data that, you know, because we're focused on markets, right? So sentiment data, activity, right? These are things that you can look at and follow where, you know, at the end of the day, like X has to play to a much broader audience, and so they can't be like, "Hey, I mean, I guess Elon can do whatever Elon wants to do, right? Like, who knows?" But I think he's know, proven that, Rishi. Yeah, yeah. Clearly, <laughs> right? Um, uh, I'm sure the shareholders are excited. Um, but uh, you know, like, I think that's our opportunity advantage. I do believe, like, there are certain spaces where verticalization and the focus on those communities delivers a lot of value to the community. And I think finance is one of those. I think sports is one of those. Um, you know, and obviously we've seen the rise of sports betting and. And that's also reflected in like interest in companies like DraftKings and whatnot, and obviously you guys at Yahoo have a lot of interest in sports. Um, you know, so uh, yeah, I mean, I think you know, uh, X has to play a different game, um, and uh, we're fortunate that you know we're focused, and we've been around for 14 years, and mm -hmm. you know, not going anywhere on that. All right, Rishi, thanks so much for coming in. I appreciate Thank you guys. it. Pleasure. Thank you, Rishi. Thanks yeah. so much. Well, let's get back to the broader markets here and the battle between fear and greed on Wall Street. It's now leaning toward greed. Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery has that story. Hey, Jared. Hey there. Well, we're looking at uh, a few different categories here, but let me just skip to the main point. We are in extreme greed territory. Uh, first of all, this is the S&P 500 year to date, and you can see uh, if this looks like a greedy move to you, uh, you might be right, because this is uh, what we're seeing here. Uh, extreme greed. Now, you'll notice it could be higher. It could be more extreme in this greed category. We're at 76 out of 100, but there are a number of different factors here which are uh, factoring in. The first is market momentum. First of all, the S&P 500 is well above its 200-day moving average, and in fact, this system uses a 150-day moving average. Stock price strength, this has to do with how many new highs are we seeing on the New York Stock Exchange every day, and as a percent of total issues, once this gets up to about 5%, this alarm starts going off. Stock price breadth, this has to do with the volume of issues that are advancing versus those that are declining. And there's something called the McClellan Volume Summation Index that helps to make that call. And then speaking of calls, we got put in call options. When investors are buying more puts, they're interested in buying more protection. And when they're buying calls, well, they're trying to bet on higher prices for equities. Right now, we are in a, a put, excuse me, right now we are in territory where puts have no love. Now, these categories that I was just going off, those are in extreme greed. What's in greed only and not extreme greed is junk, do, junk bond demand. This has to do with the spreads that we see with junk bonds and the benchmark, in, in, uh, benchmark index, which would be U.S. Treasury index. In neutral territory, excuse me, in neutral territory right here, we have market volatility. We are sitting at uh, the lowest levels in the VIX in about four years. You'd have to go back, I believe, to 2019. And uh, this is only neutral territory for it, but I believe it has to do with the relationship between the VIX and its moving average. And then there is one category that is in outright fear territory. That is safe haven demand. So if you look at stock performance versus bond performance, we know that bond performance has been abysmal over the last few years, but it has picked up recently because bonds have finally picked up, and that's when we had yields coming from 10% or 5% in the in the 10-year all the way down to 3.9%. Uh, because of that bond outperformance, we are seeing uh, a little bit of safe haven demand, at least by this indicator. But the bottom line is we are in extreme greed territory, and when we get higher, and if we keep this for a while, it actually becomes a contrary indicator. So we're wanting to get We'll want to be sure to uh, keep an eye on this as the uh, new year approaches. And here, by the way, is a chart of the greed fear index going all the way back to January. And you can see we've been in extreme greed 
several times before here, not only before the banking panic in the year, but also before a multi-month sell-off. This decline here in the fear greed also occurred with a multi-month sell-off in the S&P 500. So a little bit of warning here, but not much. Jared Blickery, thank you, my friend. Appreciate that. And coming up, the founder of the EV truck startup, Nikola, has been sentenced to prison by a federal judge. We have team coverage on the other side of this break. The founder of the EV truck startup Nikola has been sentenced by a federal judge today after a jury found him guilty of two counts of wire fraud and one count of securities fraud. Trevor Milton became a billionaire overnight when he took Nikola public for a SPAC back in June 2020. That's until allegations of false and misleading statements were raised by short seller Hindenburg Research. With more, we've got team coverage from our Alexis Keenan and Pras Subramanian. And Alexis, let's start with you on the sentencing today. Um, and what now becomes of Trevor Milton? Yeah, so he has a significant sentence. He was sentenced to four years in federal prison. Those are three sentences for three different counts, but to be served consecutively. If they had been strung out, it would have been 12 years. So these are charges that he was convicted of by a jury in Manhattan back in October of 2022, wire fraud, securities fraud. And those charges and conviction were for lying to investors, lying to the public about the capabilities of the companies of Nikola's hydrogen and electric semi and pickup truck capabilities. There are were lies that were on social media by Trevor Milton, also lies to reporters. But most prominently and most memorably was this promo video that the company had put out showing its Nikola One semi truck, hydrogen truck going down a road. But it turned out that, as you can see there in that video, the truck was not driving on its own propulsion. It was just rolling down a hill. So this was something that was supposed to convince the public to put more money into this company. Um, but this federal judge in Manhattan deciding that this would be the sentence. He will, though, be out on bail, assuming that he makes it. He was given this reprieve. The judge granted bail pending appeal of this case. And uh, the judge noted there that the experts who do these loss calculations that decide they're very significant in deciding how long a sentence will be, that they can sometimes get it wrong. So a lot of debate in court today about how much investors actually lost. 
All right. And Proz, you look at this, this stock, so it's trading for under a dollar, right? What, what is the future of this business? Is there one? Yeah, I think that there's this story now, what's next for Nikola post Milton, post this, they've put this essentially to bed now, he's, he's gonna go away for some time, but essentially it's a bet now on that hydrogen power, right? So the battery electric trucks, pretty bad recall this past summer. There was an issue with the battery packs and cooling that they had to recall all of those trucks, right? So this past Q3, they didn't deliver any trucks. They produced three, delivered, delivered I'm sorry, produced zero, delivered only three. A quarter ago, or a year ago, they, they, made, they made 75 trucks. These are all been uh, recalled. Now the big bet is on the hydrogen powered, fuel cell powered semi trucks that they have about 277 non binding orders. I mean, that's, it's not nothing, but it's also non binding, but that's yeah. their, their future from 35 different customers. They want to deliver those next year. 2024 is a big year for them. Um, and they raised 175 million bucks early this month to kind of keep them afloat for a while. So given the sentence for Trevor Milton, who's, you know, sort of fake it till you make it reminds me of Elizabeth Holmes, right, a little bit in that sense. And given what you're talking about, the struggles for Nicola post Trevor Milton, what kind of other R&D have we seen with these kinds of vehicles, with hydrogen vehicles? Because in some quarters, this is seen as kind of the next phase post-electric, right? So is it, has it thrown cold water on that? I mean, whether you believe the Nikola story, I mean, they had a new CEO just announced in August. We spoke to the one prior to that in May, and then we had the battery uh, fire recall. So the thing with the company is that hydrogen power is legitimate, right? The fuel cells are, are a, a sort of a bet on the future of stuff like, not just trucking, but cargo ship container, you know, things that high power, a lot of heavy, dense energy we need to use for stuff like um, trucking and cargo shipping, it's an option. So the question is, can Nikola be the company that does that? And I think there's some uh, question as to whether that's the case, but they do have the, the Trey truck is being built by a partner called Iveco in, in Europe, and that truck is happening, and next year is supposed to be rolling out. And then the, but the bigger question is, what's your network like? Where is these hydrogen fuel chargers or kind of uh, these, um, what are they called? Uh, terminals, sorry, terminals for when you can, you know, anyway, that's a different story. All right. <laughs> well, we'll keep on you for yeah, that part of the story. Yeah. Alexis Praz, thank you so much, guys. Appreciate that. And moving on, consumer staples are having a tough year, lagging behind most sectors and facing a tough backdrop in 2024. But there is some optimism, according to our next guest, particularly in snack foods. For more on the 2024 consumer staples outlook, we're talking to Jason English, Goldman Sachs Managing Director. Jason, it's great to see you. Um, as you know, Jason, listen, 2023, not easy if you were long consumer staples. As an analyst, Jason, what are the core financial metrics you're watching to gauge, you know, how this sector is going to perform now as we head into 2024. Well, Josh, some of the last year's underperformance has to do with two sessions ago where you talked about the fear versus greed index. Needless to say, consumer staples rest heavily on the fear side. So when the market's in a greed on type uh, moment, as we are right now, or mood, clearly my sector is left out behind. Now, from a fundamental perspective, next year is very much about the chase for top line growth. We've had very robust sales growth the last couple of years, fueled by pricing. The inflation backdrop required a lot of price growth for these companies. They achieved it. They gave leverage throughout the P&L, particularly as some of the input costs have begun to subside. But now focus is on volume, because next year, we're not going to have the type of inflation supporting top line growth. And of late, volume growth just hasn't been there. In fact, volume has been declining in the U.S. for these large processed packaged food companies. And if they can't get it back to growth, then the top lines are going to stall out, and these P&Ls just won't work. They won't deliver the type of bottom line growth that investors and management teams are expecting. Yeah, and we've definitely started to hear some food companies, whether it's consumer staples or on the restaurant side, talk about deflation as well that we are now seeing, going to see creep into uh, some of these goods. Are there any companies that are going to be able to have pricing power going into 2024? And if there are, what distinguishes them from their competitors? Yeah, it's a good question, Julie, and this is good news for consumers. Obviously, the, the cost to buy your groceries has been going nothing but higher the last few years. As we look into next year, in some pockets, we would actually expect a degree of deflation. Some of those are passed through categories like meat or flour, but even in more branded centric companies like canned, canned goods, soup, for example, we're seeing deflation as promotions come back to the market. So these companies need to get volume going, look, look for them to spend into more promotions. Good news for the consumer, not necessarily good news for many of the companies 
companies because that deflation is really expensive and damaging to the P&L. So the question you asked is spot on, who are the companies who can have continued pricing power, resilient price growth, even if modest? There we look for companies with emerging market exposure, where we're expecting the rate of inflation in those markets to sustain. Um, companies that fit that bill would be Procter & Gamble, Colgate, Coke, Mondelez as some examples. And then we're also favoring snack food companies where there's a degree of conspicuous consumption that gives brands more power with more brand-centric, also comes more pricing power. And I like snack foods in particular because the market's really thrown them out with the bathwater this year because the, the volume has been weak for the industry at large, and many are arguing that GLP-1s are going to destroy volume. It's caused many of these snack food companies to derate. I think that fear is overdone, and I'm looking for a bounce back next year with snack foods. And when you say snack foods, Jason, do you mean, uh, is it Kelanova, PepsiCo? What, what, what are the names that you, that you would be telling investors you think look attractive here? Yeah, I'm, when I say snack foods, I mean it broadly the same way you would think about it. Potato chips, meat snacks, cookies, crackers, et cetera. In terms of companies that are well positioned for the bounce back, I like Kelanova a lot. Many of you probably don't even know what Kelanova is. It's former <laughs> Kellogg. They, they spun out the North America cereal business. So now we're left with a snack food company, brands like Pringles and Cheez-It. So really good, iconic brands. It's trading in line with, with laggard food companies like General Mills. I don't think that multiple parity will, will, will persist. I do expect relative separation for Kelanova next year. Uh, Pepsi is well positioned on the Frito side. You know, people forget, there does not not everyone knows that, that Pepsi owns Frito-Lay, which is a huge business for them and a big profit and growth driver. And then Hertie would be another company that if you look at that stock chart, we've gone from 275 to, to 180. Um, some of it's been earned, but we think the, the, the sell-off there is a bit overdone and next year is going to be a better year for them. And then, Jason, on the flip side, the stuff that you do not like right now, you already talked about your emerging markets thesis. So companies you don't like as much are those that are more U.S.-centric, but you also call them center of plate food companies. In other words, not snacks, but meal companies, I guess. Yeah. Why are they not as preferable right now? Sure. So we say center of plate. We also say center of store. And just, just envision mm -hmm. yourself walking through the grocery store. And you've got the perimeter, which has a lot of prepared foods, a lot of fresh foods, a lot of fresh vegetables, dairy. And you got the center of store, which is where your processed, engineered, ambient temperature foods sit. Um, rewind the clock to a decade ago. I bet you when you walked that store, that center of store was bigger. The perimeter was smaller. Um, you're seeing store footprints change to accommodate a lot more prepared foods and fresh foods and shrink out the center store because that's where consumer demand has been going. And it's not sort of moment in time. It's been secular. Consumers have been migrating away from engineered processed foods. That means the center of store, um, particularly around, to your point, center of plate, ingredient foods. So there's secular headwinds there. And if we're betting on where we can see volume return to growth, I'm going to bet again Against those companies and against those categories. And, and Jason, I want to get you out of here, here on this. I'm just interested, what are you hearing, Jason, from your companies who um, look at China as an important end market? You know, obviously a lot of people were expecting this kind of post-COVID boom that hasn't worked out, it's shaky. What do you expect from that market in 2024? It's, it's bad. It's a short answer of what we're hearing from our companies. Throughout last year, it was a story of the recovery is not as robust as we expected. Um, now we're hearing a story of not just is the recovery not as robust, but we're actually going backwards. And, and growth isn't where we ought to be. It's actually in some areas we're seeing pockets of decline. So the outlook for China has eroded in the last couple of months based on the narrative and what we're hearing from our companies. If we think about emerging markets more broadly, there's still a very bullish sentiment out there, uh, particularly around Latin America, where demand strength has been really robust. India is another example where the outlook is still robust, and as well as Southeast Asia outside of China, Indonesia, Philippines, v Vietnam. A lot of investment going into those markets where per capita consumption of these foods still materially lags the developed world. Jason English, great to get some time with you today. Lots of good insight, lots of good tickers for our viewers. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Coming up, we got another ticker for you, Roku. It's edging lower today after a downgrade at Seaport Research. We'll dig into the details with the analyst who made that call. That's after the break.
Roku getting a downgrade to sell from Seaport Research Partners, citing caution on its growth prospects and a valuation that's tough to justify. It's coming amid a competitive streaming landscape with Disney Plus and Netflix gobbling up a large chunk of the ad supply. For more on the state of Roku, we bring in David Joyce, Seaport Research Partners Senior Media Analyst. David, it's great to see you. So, no fan of Roku. You're telling your clients this one is officially a sell. How come, David? What, what's the argument? No, thanks for having me. So Roku shares actually have done quite well in the fall. We just launched coverage back in uh, early October and it was roughly 70. It dipped to 56 before uh, earnings and then went on a tear last week, even touched 110. So that's, that's just in the course of a couple months. It was uh, trading last week at three and a half times revenue. Uh, even today, it's at 3.1 times revenue, and they're still burning cash uh, through most of 2025. They do have plenty of cash on hand to handle that, so we're not concerned about you know, their liquidity. I think it is still quite a viable business model. It still has a good uh, position in the marketplace, but where we're concerned is uh, that their ad growth right now seems to be lagging that of the digital video industry. Uh, we have them growing maybe 9% uh, this quarter, another 9% next year. Uh, in part, the upfront markets were a bit soft. They also rely a lot on media and entertainment advertising, which uh, has been delayed because of the, uh, the writers and actors strike earlier this year. The rest of the digital video uh, ad market should be growing in the 12 or 13% range. So on the, on the margin, it seems like their share is slipping. Uh, we think that that's going to these new advertising tiers that uh, Netflix has come out with and that uh, Disney Plus has come out with. And also looking ahead, uh, you know, we still have to do more work on it, but Amazon Prime Video is getting you know, more into uh, new video advertising is the expectation, given that they've been investing in content. So that's just one of the areas where I, I think that the uh, the, 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 the valuation, the enthusiasm on what Roku does uh, is, is probably uh, played itself out for now. Uh, just a little concerned about what the competitive landscape might be doing on the advertising side. Additionally, we have some uh, concerns about uh, where the device side of the market is going. It's not an area where they're trying to uh, grow profitability, but it is uh, an area where they have really driven a lot of uh, their active uh, users. Uh, and and the, the, the great thing that Roku did for the overall streaming industry was train consumers to start streaming. Uh, they got people off of their very clunky, uh, older definition of smart TVs or connected TVs using the, the Roku devices. And now Roku has its own TV as well. But as people cycle out their uh, you know, their their TVs uh, and get new ones, you're you're more increasingly you're having more apps for the where, you, where the consumer can go straight to the, uh, the to the content provider, the Disney Plus, the Netflix, and you not necessarily need the Roku device now. Right. Um, so it is an installed base of 75 million that provides a lot of value, provides some uh, ad in, uh, impressions. But, but, but uh, we, we think that the, that the growth trajectory might be slowing from here. I mean, and what you describe isn't just a slowing growth trajectory, David. It's almost an existential question about what the purpose of this company is at this point, right? If I can buy a TV from an existing device provider that can do it, that already I can get, all, get to all the apps, what do I need Roku for? What do I need a Roku TV for, right? Well, it is a company that has reinvented itself at, in, in terms of uh, adding some new revenue streams. It's doing some more with uh, e-commerce e uh, e partners. Uh, they have uh, on the Roku channel, they've got some of their own content now that they've been investing in. It's going to uh, perhaps you know, attract people to watch This Whole House and Martha Stewart and other, other pieces of content that they've invested in that will have their own ad impressions. Uh, so there, there are aspects to the business model that they've been, you know, that they've been uh, adjusting, so they have, you know, some more of this uh, user active user base. And as they uh, roll out more uh, Roku TVs, you know, earlier this year they had 43% share of the new TVs. There's both Roku branded TVs as well that, that they're producing, as well as um, those made by others. That is that that is adding to the active user base while they're losing some of the older uh, user base who are cycling out into new TVs. So I'm not uh, I'm not calling it an existential issue. I think that they are reinventing themselves, but it's still reinventing within uh, a few buckets of revenue streams that that uh, do seem to have uh, some increasing competition on the horizon. 
And Dave, I want to get you out of here on this. You know, sometimes Roku, you'll hear this kind of hot talk speculation that maybe it could be a, an M&A target. You think that's a possibility, David? It's it's always a possibility. Uh, my, one of my other concerns about Roku is that their uh, adjusted EBITDA metric you know, backs out a lot of stock compensation that might not be part of the metric of a potential buyer. So buying Roku at this level could be dilutive for you know, many companies. It might not be economic. Uh, it might not be economic for a lot of potential acquirers unless they can really justify what this can do product-wise uh, uh, to the strategy of some other you know, product set. So th there, could, there could be the you know, logic uh, to a certain deal, and that would be one of the risks uh, to the uh, to our sell uh, recommendation, as would be uh, you know, their ability to execute on advertising you know, the, been better than peers. But for now, like, we do think that they're, you know, the, the, on the advertising side, you do have some incremental competition from the very big platform companies coming in here. David, thanks so much. Really appreciate your time today. Thanks for having me. Coming up, we got the closing bell on Wall Street. We'll be checking in on the latest market moves and the top trending tickers. Stay tuned. Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. Right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Mester Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance. You're watching Yahoo Finance. We're just a few moments until the closing bell. We wanted to run through some of the uh, themes that we've been watching today. Now, first of all, the Dow is coming into the close not so strong. It's a little mm -hmm. changed right now. Uh, the S&P still hanging on to a gain of a half of 1%. The NASDAQ up six tenths of 1%. Something else I wanted to quickly check on is what's going on in the bond market today. There we are actually seeing a little bit of a bump up in yields back towards 4%. What's interesting, what sort of caught our eye to here today was that amidst all of this, the trending tickers today are kind of magnificent seven heavy. Yeah. And there's no particular news that seems to be driving it. As we just showed you, yields are up today. Mm -hmm. So it's not clear exactly what's going on unless it's more of that sort of end of year jockeying that we were talking about. Meta up 2.8%, Amazon up about 2.7%, Nvidia's on this list too up two and a half percent. Well, and your jockeying is a good reason. You know, that could sure. be, a, I mean, the journal had a good stat on this, that if you looked at those Magnificent Seven, they jumped 75% this year, meaning they uh, they also left the other 493 names in the SPX just in the dust. You know, part of that, of course, the boom of interest in AI, now the question becomes, do you keep playing that in 2024? Right. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, here's NVIDIA up 243%. Amazon on the year up 83%. Meta up, um, 186%, so people did well by being in these stocks. Now, at the end of the year, you might see a little pullback on these as people start to take a little profit at the margins, but that's not happening. If it's going to happen, mm -hmm. it's not happening yet in enough size to make a big difference with what the stock is doing. And then quickly as well, we can look at the sectors because it's expressing itself there. Well, here's the NASDAQ 100, so you see it here as well. Microsoft's also up, Alphabet is also up today, which is quite interesting, and then of course, you know, Broadcom, which is now one of the bigger companies because of its acquisition Rocket of Rocket ship VMware. in 2023. Um, and if you yeah. look at the sectors and what we're seeing today, it's communication services, which is again, Mag7 heavy, mm -hmm. that is leading the pack. Well, there you have the closing bell on Wall Street. So indeed, as we just talked about, the Dow losing a little steam in here 
into the closing bell, but we are still seeing pretty consistent strength of large cap tech here. Looks like the Dow might eke out a gain. Usually it takes a few moments for the numbers to settle. Uh, but remember, any gain for the Dow today should be another record for that index because of the strong um, the strong performance that we saw last week to end the week. The NASDAQ, um, I believe, the NASDAQ 100, recall, was at a record, and the NASDAQ and the S&P trading at their highest levels since 2022. So again, continuing with this momentum that we have been seeing, even as, you know, and Julian Emanuel of Evercore was mm -hmm. the latest person to say this, are we getting a little ahead of our skis here, given the outlook for the Federal Reserve? On, uh, you know, on that point, we keep watching Fed speak as the Fed tries to sort of manage market expectations. Yeah, Julian sounded a little bit more cautious there, get defensive, right? Yeah, it looks like, again, the Dow and the NASDAQ 100 did indeed have record highs again, just confirming, uh, getting some numbers from Jared Blickery here. The Dow and the NASDAQ composite up for eight straight days nice at run. this point, yes. All right, let's get some tickers here. The Chinese electric vehicle maker NIO has seen shares. The seen shares are bouncing today after it announced that they have received 2.2 billion from an Abu Dhabi investor. So that was the headline. Nice pop. Uh, the Abu Dhabi investor CYVN, which apparently gives the group a 20% stake in the Chinese EV maker. They're also entitled to nominate two directors, it sounds like, to NIO's board. Of course, NIO very well known to focus on um, focusing more on the high end of that market, Julie. Right, and this stock has not done great year to date. It's down about 14% as we've seen some back and forth within the Chinese market because um, NIO does sell some of its vehicles outside of the US, uh, outside of China rather, but most of its vehicles are sold within China. And so it has been buffeted by some of the concerns over the economy there. So this a little bit of uh, welcome relief perhaps for NEO investors. Uh, as we were talking about earlier uh, with Rishi Khanna, you know, this has been one of the stocks that has been of high interest to retail investors who were trying to play this broader EV theme, um, but it hasn't worked out so well for them in this particular case yeah, this they, year. Yeah, they have been, you know, neo has been making moves. I mean, they've been cutting costs, definitely, trying different strategies. I mean, one issue is you're you're in the high end, you're battling Tesla, and right. he's very, and obviously Musk has been playing the game, he's been very clear, he's willing to, you know, cut prices, it's, it's a volume game, even right. if it sacrifice margins, so that's been tough going for Neo to compete there. Yeah, definitely has. All right, um, we also were talking about what's going on in the steel industry, and just to expand upon that, Nippon has agreed to buy United States Steel for $14.1 billion. It creates the world's second largest steel company and the biggest outside of China. Now, there's a ripple effect here because the move has sent stocks of rival Cleveland Cliffs rising um, after U.S. Steel rejected an offer from Cleveland Cliffs, at least one offer earlier in the year. The shares are up 9.5%, though, because the company now says, what's it going to do with that money that it would have potentially used to buy U.S. Steel? It's going to buy back shares. It doesn't say exactly how much here, but it says it's going to aggressively yep. uh, buy back shares here. And so the shares are trading higher. Uh, the CEO, Lorenzo Goncalves, uh, Lorenco Goncalves, rather, saying uh, the shares are significantly undervalued still. And so that's why they're doing the share uh, buyback authorization. There was sort of a bidding war effectively for U.S. Steel. Yep. And Cleveland Cliffs, even though it was the loser today, is the winner in terms and of that. And now you do kind of wonder what their next move is as well. Yeah. If you're Cleveland Cliffs, do they do they try again? Do they eye another target? If so, which one? You know, I mean, most analysts continue to like this name, right. say it's a buy, and it's had a nice year. This the the fact that they're doing this buyback seems to indicate they are not going to continue to bid for U.S. Steel. What's interesting is U.S. Steel and Cleveland Cliffs are seen. Um, as sort of the older guard, not having their less cost-effective methods to produce steel, less technologically forward. You've got Steel Dynamics and Nucor, which are the more sort of tech-forward, more efficient steel makers. So does Cleveland Cliffs then end up teaming up with one of the other existing independent U.S. steel makers? You know, I think we'll have to see what happens. The drama continues. Yes. Shares of Adobe, meanwhile, ending the trading day higher. It's after announcing it terminated its $20 billion merger with design software firm Figma. The deal falling apart and regulatory battles with officials from the EU and UK. Our next guest thinks there's some upside for Adobe. Here with more is Alex Zukin, Wolf Research Managing Director and Head of Software Research. So Alex, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Interested to get your, your take on this news, Alex. I was talking to Julie earlier in the program about this. 
as you kind of read through the analyst notes today, Alex, you know, the, the folks like yourself who, who cover this, um, rather than being disappointed, it seemed like a lot of financial analysts kind of welcomed the news. You even saw some upgrades, Alex, on that headline. People seeing it as kind of a, a positive catalyst. How did you see it? Yeah, look, I, I, I can't say I'm that surprised. We, we did think uh, this, this deal was unlikely uh, to, to get done, um, partially driven by the, the regulatory environment, some of the regulatory decisions that were made uh, or guidelines that were released by, by the CMA a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I think also the size of the deal, remember this deal was done kind of at the height uh, of, of the tech boom uh, post COVID. And, and, and so some of the valuation metrics um, you know, we're, we're, we're stretched pretty high. I, I, again, I think Fig was a generational asset. We, we talked about it quite heavily. And we think that, quite frankly, Adobe is going to do just fine, uh, you know, with on the merits of a number of AI functionalities that they have across the product portfolio. So sometimes the best, best way forward is a part. Well, and are they going to do just fine or are they going to do even better without Figma, you know, sort of hanging over it? How much of an asset are they sort of losing out on by not going ahead with this deal? So to be clear, I think Figma is a, a phenomenal asset. I think they're the market leader uh, in a category for product design where Adobe has now publicly stated they're no longer willing to pursue that category. They took their product that was competing in this market, DX, uh, and they end of life it. Uh, they're going to partner with Figma in order to serve this market for uh, their joint customers, but they're not going to go after this market. Uh, I think that the opportunity for Adobe uh, to buy back stock, uh, the opportunity for Adobe to focus, the, for the entire executive team now to focus on organic product innovation around you know, the creative cloud portfolio, around uh, the, the digital experience portfolio where there's a tremendous amount of opportunity. I think that's a positive. I think this removes uncertainty to the point that you're making. And I think removing uncertainty is a positive for the narrative right now. And Alex, just to kind of emphasize that point. So, I mean, obviously you terminate this deal, it does free up a lot of cash for Adobe. You're saying you think they allocate that toward capital return, toward buybacks? I do, yeah, I do. I, I would expect a pretty sizable buyback. Um, we've you know, thought through uh, an eight to ten billion dollar uh, share buyback figure before. Uh, I'm still pretty confident that's that's more in the minimum kind of kind of target. Then, uh, and, and I think there's a lot of opportunity there. And Alex, um, I want to switch gears a little bit and broaden it out to your outlook for 2024. You were out with an extensive note. Um, and an amusing one looking at what's going on for 2024. But let's zero in on your uh, one of your top calls for next year, and that's Salesforce, which you're upgrading um, to an outperformance, saying that's one of the, the best bets here. What do you think Salesforce has got to get right next year for, for it to perform as you're talking about? Yeah, I think it's a combination of three points. I think point one is double-digit growth. I think this is a company that has a lot of wind at its back. I think the organic product innovation around data cloud, I think the pricing opportunity and the uplift possible from generative AI in the portfolio. Uh, and I think just the, the renewed culture and uh, sense of uh, selling uh, enables this company to perform at least as good as we think they can executing to double digit growth uh, for the next few years. I think point two, uh, is a commitment to for that growth to be profitable, responsible, uh, and that's language for margins that are going to continue to go up. I think if you look at where the company crossed a pretty meaningful threshold in operating margin performance this year, uh, all the way up to 30%, I think that's a great start and they should be extremely proud of that. And I think the next stop is 40%. That's where you go from uh, you know, really strong and solid to iconic. I don't think they're going to get there next year, but I think the journey to get to 40% matching companies like Microsoft, Adobe, uh, and the like is something that this is, there's no reason why uh, Salesforce can't get there. And I think that unlocks a lot of incremental earnings power, a lot of incremental free cash flow that investors are going to want to underwrite and invest behind. And finally, I think a commitment to responsible. Uh, m and uh, it has been something the company has talked about the last few earnings calls. I think that's going to be really important for this stock to keep on working, um, where whether it's small tuck-ins or, or larger strategic deals, having at the outset really a framework and a commitment to how that can be accretive to either the growth and the profitability of the, of the company is going to be super important for investors.
Yeah, and, and then I wanted to, to do that. I wanted to ask you about that, Alex, because you know Mark Benioff, he likes to pull the trigger on big acquisitions. So I guess it's part of your call here. You think there's just minimal risk that he's going to do that next year because obviously that would that would have a big impact on where you think margins are headed. Yeah, that's probably the most important crux uh, of of the bet. And look, I, I actually I bring the Figma Adobe situation right back into this uh, into the mix here. Part of the you know, part of the settlement here is that the regulators are saying no to big strategic M&A. And I think that's actually a positive for Salesforce. I think it's going to be harder for them to engage in larger strategic M&A, not impossible, certainly, but I think it lowers the likelihood that they would uh, pursue that. Now, I will also say that if they do go down that road, I think the ability to, you know, really be to pick and choose and to very cogently outline the profitability potential uh, and the accretion potential of the M&A is going to be very important. But my opinion is that you're going to be looking at Salesforce to do more tuck-ins, more kind of the aqua hire type of deals rather than the big meaty uh, dilute of M&A of the past. And Alex, I want to get you out of here on, on another name we talk a lot about and traders love discussing and thinking about and debating, which is Palantir. Alex, you know, that stock, again, it's up about 180% in 2023, Alex. I know that you have the equivalent of a sell on that on that name. How come, Alex? Is part of the reason just the stock move we've seen? Yeah, look, this has definitely been the worst call we've made all year. i um, not afraid to to call a spade a spade there, but, and, and we're really fond of the company. Uh, I think what we're not fond of is the valuation. Uh, I think we boil things down to numbers, and this is a company that's going to be growing in the mid-teens, uh, and it's trading at a revenue multiple higher than its growth rate. And we just think that, you know, doesn't make that much sense. Part of the business, I think, is a very interesting high growth business. We're willing to give that part of the business a high multiple. Uh, but the rest, you know, that's where kind of we arrive at our price target that's, you know, closer to 40% downside from here uh, than upside. So we, we think the horizon is, is pretty positive in terms of the fundamentals, but I think the valuation's just gone, gotten way, way too far ahead of itself. All right, Alex, thank you so much for, for joining us today, Alex. Really appreciate your insight in those stock picks. Always great to join you, Josh. Thank you very much for having me. And coming up, more Yahoo Finance on the other side of this break.
With only a few weeks left in 2023, it's time to start thinking about your portfolio in 2024. And here at Yahoo Finance, we'll be answering some of the biggest questions heading into next year with our 2024 Investor Guide. And today we are talking Fed. Despite some mixed messages, it seems consensus is that it's done raising rates after the fastest increases in four decades. And it's now a case of not if, but when we will see cuts. Our very own Jennifer Schonberger has been on the Fed beat all year. She joins us now to break down what to look for in 2024. Jen. Josh, it was the pivot that surprised us all, sending stocks to record highs and pushing bond yields down. The Federal Reserve last week signaled it has likely reached the peak on rates and penciled in three rate cuts for next year. You see that people are not writing down rate hikes. That's that's us thinking that we have done enough, but not, not feeling that really strongly, confidently, and not wanting to take the possibility of a rate hike off the table. Nonetheless, it's not the base case anymore. But now officials are already starting to walk back that dovishness as financial conditions have loosened. Reportedly, Chicago Fed President Austin Goolsbee said the Fed is not pre-committing to cutting rates soon or swiftly, while New York Fed President John Williams said it was premature to talk about a rate cut in March. And Cleveland's Loretta Mester said it's about how long we will hold at these levels now. Yet that's not enough to stop markets from pricing in more cuts than the Fed expects next year, with the first starting in March. So then looking ahead, what would it take for the Fed to cut rates? And what should investors keep their eye on? Here are three main major areas. Number one, progress on inflation. Officials still aren't sure that inflation is decisively moving back down to 2%. They don't want to be head faked. This year, the economy surprised to the upside in the third quarter, and they want to be sure that inflation doesn't stall or reverse course. Number two, the Fed will begin cutting rates well before inflation falls to their 2% target. That is what Chair Powell told me at the press conference last week. Otherwise, he says we will overshoot. So how much further do we have to go? Well. Uh, Chair Powell didn't show his hand, but former St. Louis Fed President James Bullard said he'd need to see inflation come below 3% before cutting. Recall, he was a major hawk on the committee. And finally, number three, a softening job market and economic growth. The job market will need to continue rebalancing. Watch the unemployment rate. Economic growth will also need to be subdued. Whether the economy falls into a recession or not could determine how quickly or how much the Fed cuts rates. Now, looking at the trajectory of inflation and how fast it has been falling, it would probably put the Fed on course for a rate cut sometime in the second half of next year, June at the earliest, but more likely sometime in the third quarter. I will have more insight from the Fed when I speak with Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin tomorrow morning exclusively right here on, on Yahoo Finance at 930 in the morning. Guys. Jennifer Schoenberger, thanks so much. Looking forward to it. And you can add another Fed official to the list of FOMC members calling for rate cuts. San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly saying in an interview with The Wall Street Journal, it's just out a little while ago, that cutting rates might be needed to prevent over tightening as the central bank has made progress on fighting inflation. Joining us now is Stephen Stanley, Santander Chief U.S. Economist. Good to see you, Stephen. Thanks for coming in. Um, so... What do we, you know, there's always the, what the Fed chair says and then sort of other Fed speak managing around it. How do we cut through that and figure out what they intend? Right. Well, I, I, I'm not sure the message is totally inconsistent. I just think the markets really right. kind of took what Powell said last Wednesday and went to town with it. I mean, um, the, the projections showed three rate cuts next year. Uh, the markets already had well over that priced in and they just went and priced more. I think what they heard was green light to pricing in more cuts. Um, and what you're hearing now going back is literally very similar to what Powell said, but the tone is a little bit mm. different. And, and Stephen, when you think uh, next year and you look at inflation, what does the trajectory of inflation look like to you? Yeah, well, it's coming down, but in my view, we're, we're, what we're seeing now is a little bit exaggerated in terms of the progress that we're getting on an underlying basis, because there are certain categories 
which tend to be volatile and, and they've all been falling lately, right? So it kind of exaggerates the, the degree of progress that we're seeing. So I, I, I don't want to say that the, uh, the disinflation is going to stall out, but I think it's going to slow down as we head into the early part of 2024. So I'm not quite in such a hurry as the markets are to, uh, to think about early 2024 rate cuts. So what do you think then is the biggest risk going into next year? It's that, is it that the Fed sort of cuts too early or is it that they cut too late at this point? Ooh, that's tough. I mean, they, they, Powell's talked about how those risks are starting to even out. I, I think, you know, you, you heard all of last year, um, Powell just pounding the table that we're not gonna let inflation get out of hand. We're gonna get it back to 2% no matter what. And now all of a sudden, as inflation is coming down, what we're hearing is starting to sound more dovish. So yeah. it almost sounds to me like the Fed is ready to declare victory and get on with it, start cutting rates. Everybody loves it when the Fed's cutting rates, right? It's not so popular when they're raising. And so I, I do think it feels like there's some risk that perhaps they go a little bit early um, and then inflation reaccelerates. But I mean, look, that, that's an easy fix, right? I mean, if they, if they cut a little bit and then they have to go back and tighten again, it's not the end of the world. And in order to cut, Stephen, what do they need to see? I mean, is it just like, okay, they become really confident we are returning to that 2% target, or no, it's gotta be that plus the economy slowing? What are they looking for? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And, and that's something that Powell was asked and a lot of these uh, officials have been asked, do you need to see economic weakness to have a rate cut? And I think the answer to that is no. Um, what Powell and others have talked about is that as inflation is coming down, if nominal rates stay the same, real rates are rising. So policy is in effect getting tighter, right? So what I think that a lot of Fed officials have in mind for next year is just tracking down with nominal rates in line with whatever deceleration we see in inflation. So people were pointing out at the press conference that, hey, you have rates coming down just about the same amount that you have inflation decelerating. Is that a coincidence or, you know, is that, and he said, look, there's no plan. We didn't coordinate that, but I mean, that's kind of theoretically what the Fed, I think, has in mind. So are you then in the soft landing camp? Do you think we're going to get a recession or do you think that they did it? Well, I, I am in the soft landing camp. Um, there's certainly a risk of a recession. I think we are definitely going to get subpar growth next year. Um, and, and actually, I'm a little bit weaker than the Fed forecast. Uh, what does subpar growth look like? So um, the Fed thinks that trend is 1.8. Let's just call it two for argument's sake, um, I have something closer to one. So it's it's slow. It probably means a uh, modest uh, backup in the unemployment rate. Uh, it's not going to feel great, but it doesn't, you know, the growth number doesn't have a minus sign in front of it. So the, the danger there is as the economy slows, it, it gets vulnerable. It's wobbly. Mm -hmm. It's like a person that's pedaling on a bicycle very slowly, right? It doesn't take much to, to fall over. So if the economy's growing at, say, 1%, and you're hit by a shock of some sort, it's much easier for the economy to tumble into recession than it would be if the economy were growing at three mm -hmm. or four percent. How about when you think about growth next year, Steve, how much of a downside risk is sort of the lagged effects of this rate hiking campaign we've been on? There's definitely, in my view, there's definitely more to come in terms of the impact of, uh, of the rate hikes. I mean, you've got right now a lot of people are still uh, kind of hiding out in their fixed rate mortgages, corporations that have uh, termed out fixed rate debt. And over time, more and more people are forced to refinance at what now are higher market levels, right? So I do think that there will be continuing uh, impact from, from the Fed rate hikes that come into the economy over the course of 2024, for sure. Uh, on the flip side, as I think back on 2023 and the so-called vibe session, right, that even when things were still growing, people didn't feel great, in large part because of inflation. Yeah. You have to wonder, even if things are only growing by 1% next year, even if the unemployment rate's ticking up, if inflation is decelerating, right. will people sort of feel okay? And then does that feed into things like consumer spending, for example? Yeah, well, I mean, I think what really matters is, is what real incomes look like, mm -hmm. right? So if your incomes are growing faster than inflation, you're feeling okay, and if they're falling short, not so much. So like, for example, last year, employment was growing you know, at a very rapid clip, GDP growth was fine, but inflation was faster than, than income growth and, and people weren't feeling so hot. This year, inflation has come down, so that has definitely um, helped, but you're right. I mean, people are, people's moods that we've learned over the last yes. couple of years are very closely tied to inflation. Stephen, last question, completely out of left field here. <laughs> Jay Powell, how much do you think, Stephen, he's 
thinking about this country's fiscal challenges? I realize it's not, you know, listen, that's not his responsibility, but I'm just curious how much you think he's considering that. I, th I mean, I don't think it's the first thing on his mind, but it's yeah. something he's got to be thinking about. And it's a very tricky situation because I think the Fed as a whole has become very politicized. There are a lot of aspects of Fed policy that Congress is like, you know, weighing in on very frequently. And so I think he's taken the stance of, look, you do your thing and I'll do mine. So if I don't criticize you on fiscal policy, then I'm hoping for a little more of a free hand on monetary policy. But the reality is, and he's said it in general terms, our fiscal situation is, is kind of a mess right now. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's gonna, it's gonna be a problem if, if we don't see progress on that front, mm. so. All right, Stephen, thank you so much for joining us today. That was great Pleasure. insight for our viewers, appreciate it. Sure. And coming up, President Biden reportedly unhappy with his approval ratings ahead of the 2024 presidential election. We're gonna dig into how he could turn that ship around after the break. The European Union is opening up an investigation into X. Regulators are examining the platform's efforts to stop information manipulation, as well as the spread of illegal content on its platform. Joining us now is Axios tech policy reporter, Maria Curie. Maria, it is great to see you. Maybe just walk us through this news, Maria, and are we surprised by this headline, or do we, did we see this one coming? terribly surprised and thank you for having me the dsa came into effect about five months ago and we are finally seeing it in action this is the first investigation into one of the very large platforms x and eu's uh chief of industry thierry 
Breton is, uh, this is not the first time that he has gone after these big platforms. If you recall back in October, he gave X and Meta 24 hours to do something about, you know, disinformation on their platforms related to the Hamas-Israel war. But unlike those actions, this investigation could actually result in some real consequences for the companies. And Maria, what do we know about the investigation? What exactly they're going to be looking for? What kind of evidence of what they're talking about here and, and maybe how long it's going to take? So the Hamas-Israel war and disinformation regarding um, that specific event is what prompted this, but regulators are going to be looking at a variety of things, including X's uh, content moderation practices, um, blue check deceptive design. So if you recall that blue check is now available to anyone who is willing to pay for it add transparency and data access for researchers. And as far as how long the investigation will take, there is no legal deadline for it. So, um, you know, it could take months, could take longer. Um, we don't know exactly how long at this point. Maria, do you think X, as this investigation unfolds, can they point to their community notes feature at all, which allows users to add context? Do you think that could be a, a possible viable defense here? Yeah, I'm sure that that will be one of the defenses that X takes. Another one is just the fact that they have taken down um, many posts. But, you know, counter arguments to that is um, under Elon Musk's leadership, a lot of content moderation, trust and safety employees were fired. Um, the blue check changes were made. A lot of banned accounts were reinstated. Um, and so clearly uh, whatever actions they're taking hasn't been enough um, for certain regulators. Well, and speaking of regulators, it, it continues to be fascinating the tack that European regulators take versus U.S. regulators, right? So can you talk a little bit more broadly about that approach, not just with regard to X, but to social media, sort of bigger picture? Absolutely. So this is just the DSA at work, but Europe also has their Digital Markets Act. They, of course, have a uh, privacy standard. They just came to an agreement on the EU AI Act. Meanwhile, here in the US, we're still in the learning phases of AI. We don't have a federal privacy standard. And so, you know, once again, um, a lot of American companies and social media giants are different standards versus the US, as lawmakers here try to. And Maria, as, the, as X deals with this investigation in Europe, I'm just curious, what are possible consequences, ramifications? What, what are the fines they could be looking at? So they could face an up to 6% global revenue fine, um, as well as mandates to change certain practices by a certain deadline. All right, Maria Curie, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. President Biden's approval rating hitting a new all-time low. Yahoo Finance senior columnist Rick Newman is here. Rick, what gives? Inflation is decelerating. Isn't, aren't things supposed to be better? How low can it go? <laughs> uh, I, I'm actually surprised. This poll shows 34% uh, approval rating for President Biden uh, in the aggregate of polls maintained by 538 and by Real Clear Politics. He's still a little higher than that, around 40%. But it, it seems to be going in the wrong direction, Julie. Uh, I mean, you would think that as inflation gets down to the 3% range, and let's not forget about gasoline prices, all the way down to around three bucks a gallon and probably going lower. I mean, those are all going the right direction for President Biden. And I, I think the sort of main narrative here is that inflation is just becoming less and less of a story. And there is every reason to think that will continue. So you'd think that this would be good because uh, Biden's infl uh, excuse me, I was going to say his inflation rating, but I mean his approval rating. I mean, it went down in um, in direct correlation to inflation going up in 2022. But as inflation has come down, uh, Biden's approval rating hasn't budged. In fact, it appears to be going down even further. So what's going on here? I think a lot of people are kind of puzzled by this. I mean, one explanation is that uh, all the price increases that have taken place over the last two years, those are not going away. Those are still there. So people are still paying those. But maybe it's something else. I mean, maybe it really is his age. Um, we know that he's doing really poorly on immigration and on the chaos at the southwest border with uh, thousands of migrants uh, coming across. 
Maybe that's it, although it's, there's not really anything new about that. Maybe it's that people see another war in the Middle East and they just feel unnerved. But uh, look, Biden is clearly taking it on the chin here. Rick, these numbers are just absolutely awful for Biden, right? So give me the Rick Newman take, the Rick Newman chances I'm interested here are whether Biden actually stays in this race. I mean, do you see it as 90 percent, 75, 50 percent? What do you think? Yeah, at this point, I, I think, uh, you know, assuming that he stays healthy, I think it's upwards of 95 percent. Um, I, I mean, he it, it's almost too late for anybody to get else, to, else to get in unless there is some kind of emergency. Uh, and look, um, you know, Biden's got an ego. Um, he's not just Mr. Uh, everyday dude. Um, he clearly uh, thinks that this is his moment. Um, you know, politicians can, uh, you know, be very adept at just rationalizing away bad news or convincing themselves that uh, six months from now, it's all gonna look much better. It might, I mean, it's possible that in six months or nine months, uh, or 11 months, which is what Biden really needs, that this situation actually looks better for him because the war between Israel and Hamas, that could be over or very much simmer down by then. Uh, inflation could be a nothing burger in the 2% range, even lower. Uh, the, the outlook for the economy actually is pretty good for 2024, but Biden is just not, not none of these benefits are accruing to him and he's gotta be wondering, what am I doing wrong? Rick Newman, always love your perspective. Thank you, sir, for being on the show Bye, today. And coming up, Apple halting the sale of some of its newer watches right ahead of the Christmas holiday. We're going to break down the potential impact on the company on the other side of the break.
Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. Right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Mester Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance. Welcome to Yahoo Finance's group chat. I'm Josh Schaefer here with Alexander Canal and Praz Subramanian. And today we are talking Apple Watches to kick things off. And some of those hoping to be gifted this season an Apple Watch could be disappointed because guys, sales are going to be shutting down pretty soon for the latest Apple Watch in the US. So Apple's going to be removing the watches from its online stores by the afternoon of December 21st and from physical stores by December 24th. This comes after Apple lost a patent case over the technology that smartwatches use to detect people's pulse rate. Should note that Apple, in a comment to our Dan Howley, said that they strongly disagree with the order. They're working to find a way to get those Apple Watch Series 9 and Apple Watch Ultra 2 watches back into US stores as soon as possible. But for now, in the immediate future, they're going to be leaving stores soon. And the question I think here lingering is, does this cause sort of a surge of people trying to go get the latest watch before Christmas, before they're out of US stores, at least in the short term? And does that help out Apple in some ways of people saying, oh, I want to get that watch to make sure I get it before it leaves stores? I think so. I personally have not done my Christmas shopping yet, which is a me thing, but I feel like I'm not alone. I feel like there are people out there. And now it puts the idea in everyone's head too, right? I mean, this is obviously in the news. Mm -hmm. People are talking about it. You have the exact day where they're not going to sell it anymore. Perhaps you're like, oh, maybe this would be a good gift, or I don't have an Apple Watch. If I want one in the future, maybe now is the time. I also don't have an Apple this Watch. This sounds like something that happened for you today. <laughs> well, yes, I've actually been contemplating the Apple Watch game just because I like tracking my calories and my sleep and things like that. I just hadn't jumped on the bandwagon, but maybe I will. But I only have a couple more Noted days Apple to make Watch, a decision. Noted <laughs> Apple Watch user, possibly. Yeah, well, it's yeah. funny, because the technology that it has, the blood oxygen sensor, is actually pretty cool tech. Right. And this is the heart of the case, and this is why I sort of bought this, because I wanted to have that, plus the, the heartbeat monitoring when you're working out and things mm. like that. So, uh, Howley noted in his story that it's a $40 billion business, right? The accessories and watches, that's the third biggest business that Apple has, I and mean, that's a big, potential you know, effect for their finances there. But, but also, like, Josh, I think it's a good point. Like, maybe it's actually encourages more people to go buy right now, scoop up as much you know, inventory that there is right now before they can resolve this and maybe start cranking them back out and bring them back to the state. So we'll see. Um, it's got to see, the Massimo, Massimo, the company that, that, there's, that sued them, mm -hmm. Apple poached top executives, their chief medical officer, and 12 other employees to work on the product. So it doesn't look good for Apple for me from that kind of view. Yeah, what's interesting is Howley noted that the ban only applies to sales of the Apple Watch Series 9 and Ultra 2 sold directly through Apple. So if you go to Best Buy or another location and they have them in stock, you can still buy them on those dates. However, once that stock runs out, mm -hmm. Apple mm -hmm. is not going to be able to resupply yeah. that. At It'll be interesting point. to see too, just moving forward, what it does mean for the health push, right? As Pross was sort of getting at, I mean, one of the big pushes we've seen in the last couple Apple events has been Apple, the full care that can sort of tell you when you're sick, right? Or when something's happening that shouldn't be happening within your body and the watch sort of alerts you, right? And it can alert an emergency service. You've seen all those fancy videos and that's sort of where Apple's headed. So how do you build on that while it's staying within certain constraints here so you don't get, you're able to keep selling them? Yeah, it's funny they're using the whole like, this is going to be dangerous for consumers. They're pulling the watch off. It's very helpful, like the fall, fall note monitoring and, and heartbeat arrhythmia and things like that. But Anyway, we'll see what happens with that. So, 
I want to move on to another big story here. Bud Light Brewer Anheuser-Busch had a rocky 2023 to say the least. And it looks like next year may be tricky too as 5,000 Teamsters voted to strike across 12 of their plants. If a new contract can't be reached by the end of, uh, by the, by the end of February, they, they might strike. And you know, it kind of gets me talking about, you know, this is a quarter of their workforce. It's a lot of workers at their breweries here. Um, you know, typically most of these contracts like Alley Wright have sort of been, they, the contract comes up, they kind of, they, they make some uh, saber rattling and then they sign a deal before the contract expires. But mm -hmm. last year, not the case. Big labor see, seeing that they can actually have their, their moment here and striking actually is a good thing as long as public support is strong, right? Right, and I think you're seeing strength in numbers overall too. We've seen several labor strikes over the past year. Pros, I know you heavily covered the United Auto Workers mm -hmm. strike. I was covering the Hollywood strike to the actors and the writers. And you saw all these guilds, all these unions, received pretty sizable deals, especially considering what they were fighting for. So I think it does make workers across the United States really think, huh, can I strike? Can mm -hmm. I form a union? Can I uh, do all these things and really be up against the man, so to mm -hmm. speak, in, mm -hmm. in the corporate America world? And I feel like this is a prime example of that. The biggest thing that sticks out to me when thinking about that is Anheuser-Busch just again, right? With another headwind coming from that stock. We're just showing the year-to-date chart of Anheuser-Busch. It's basically we made a round trip since we saw it take a big decline in the spring, right? Of course, a lot of the drama surrounding Bud Light and people essentially protesting the brand after that Dylan Mulvaney ad. But the stock had rebounded from that, from the Bud Light sales mm -hmm. falling. And now you have another potential headwind maybe coming to start 2024. And at some point, it's, just, it's not about the product right now for Anheuser-Busch, right? They're having other problems than just being able to sell beer and sort of the traditional product. Yeah, I mean, this is a big, could be a, I'm sorry, could be a big problem, even bigger than Bud Light potentially. Yeah. Right. Well, Kid Rock though said he's he's done his Bud Light boycott. So. They're done with so that part. That. Yeah. So there's they're, that. They're, at least, they're on the clear on that side. At least they got Kid Rock <laughs> Kid, back. Kid Rock's team Bud Light again. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, moving on to my story, this could shake up the sports streaming world as it's being reported that Amazon is in talks with Diamond Sports Group about a potential partnership. Now, this is being reported by the Wall Street Journal. It says the two entities are active involved in negotiations regarding a strategic investment and multi-year streaming partnership. Now, if a deal is made, Amazon Prime's video service will become the official streaming home for Diamond's games. Now, Diamond is a regional sports network. It filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection back in March. It's currently in court proceedings to uh, really determine what's going to happen with that Chapter 11, whether or not it could liquidate. This deal with Amazon could potentially help them avoid a full liquidation, and it also comes as we've seen big tech, especially Amazon, really lean into sports. When you think about the different analysts we've talked to over the last two years, we've talked about Apple wanting to get into streaming, Amazon wanting to get into streaming, Google, big tech, what, what's the point here? It's not about necessarily earning a profit off the product, right? It's about getting your product and getting people on the flywheel, getting it in more households. This would make a ton of sense when you think about it from that perspective for Amazon. Local sports, MLB, NHL, MLB plays 162 games. NHL, 82 games, NBA, 82 games. And those are local households that if you can get the Amazon brand in front of, it's just a different pitch, right, than what you normally see from regional sports network. It's hard to make money in regional sports that's clearly played out, it's played out in the market. But for big tech to come in and they're not necessarily looking for a profit, it would make a lot of sense to me, right? You just get Amazon in front of more households. I mean, when I was just reading about it, this, this is good for Amazon and for Diamond, right? I mean, this is like right. a win-win situation. Look, it's, a, it's about that went wrong, right? Nine billion dollar contract, eight billion in debt, like it just mm -hmm. wasn't gonna work out, right? And then on so, top of that, you have the cord cutters. Right, Everything going right, over right. to streaming. Uh, and it just wasn't gonna work out numbers-wise, but you know, regional sports is good business. Like, teams like the Reds in the world, people watch those games in local markets. So I think it's good for Amazon, good for Diamond to get back in there and get that get that coverage out there. But um, I gotta say, but it, it's only gonna be on Prime though, right? So there's some people that like, you know, like grandmas that like the Reds, whatever, like, well, I gotta find it on Prime. So maybe they can, maybe they can't, but it, it's still, it's gonna go somewhere and maybe Amazon's the best place for it. Yeah, and, and the market seems to like this as well too, with Amazon stock closing up nearly 3%, Sinclair Broadcasting Group, which mm. owns Diamond Sports Group, also closing up above 2%, so we'll have to see. Definitely a story we will keep following and keep eyes on for you. But coming up next, we're going to have what to watch tomorrow. We're going to break down some of the stories you need to know to start your Tuesday. Coming up next.
Blue Origin, Jeff Bezos' space company, delaying its first mission in more than a year. The company running into an issue with a ground system at the launch site. It, it does say it's hoping to do the launch later this week. This was to be an unmanned trip um, to the edge of space here with some research and scientific uh, experiments on the new Shepard vehicle. There weren't going to be any people on right. board. Um, but nonetheless, you know, after it's already been grounded for 15 months, there were a lot of hopes riding on this, and we'll see how quickly they can get back in the air. Yeah, and, and while Bezos has been grounded, by the way, of course, you have rivals, you got Virgin Galactic, Sir Richard Branson's company, right? They've been kind of flying commercial flights. I think those tickets run something like two hundred to four hundred fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, a few no minutes bit, of weightlessness, no nice view of the Earth. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But from what I understand, this isn't unusual, right? I mean, you can right. have these kind of delays, and, and and from what I've been reading, this is really this most likely has to do with it sounds like the launch pad, not the rocket itself. So it sounds like. It sounds like the company is suggesting they could be up, up, and away pretty quickly. Right, exactly. And then, of course, you got SpaceX that you can throw in there too. Although they have not done commercial space flights in the same um, in the same way, they have been focused more on service and research uh, kinds of situations there. So, but it is interesting because people love to see rockets blast off. <laughs> And that's a good reason. I mean, it, uh, you that's know, a good reason. That's, you're not excited about honest. the prospect of space tourism. Not personally, but sure, I'll, I'll watch him a rocket blast off. What's You're not, what's, far. That seems what's, fair. Not, what's not to like about that? <laughs> Moving on to another story we're watching, Uber and DoorDash. They are reportedly making tipping deliveries harder after NYC wage law goes into effect. So I don't, you know, listen, we're both Jersey. So it'd be interesting how this kind of affects both customers and those doing the work for these two services. Right. So it sounds like this has to do with when you were prompted to tip, right? Yeah. So now the base pay for delivery workers, they have to get at least $17.96 an hour. This already went to effect on, on December 4th. The change now is that, you know, Uber and DoorDash have said, we can't pass this all on to our customers. So the way it works worked before, the drivers would be able to see what you were potentially going to tip and choose based on that, mm -hmm. which doesn't seem great from a customer perspective, yeah. in my opinion, because then you're paying to get that service. I, yeah. I don't know. So now they've taken that away, but now the, the risk is that these folks are not going to make as much. The other thing is it sounds like these delivery services are not going to hire as many people. So there'll be maybe less work to go around. It, it's unclear exactly how that's going to play out, but this seems to be the concern. When you're in New York, is it Uber or Lyft for you? Is it, I, I... Do you have any loyalty or just toggle? I have no, I have no really, loyalty. Really, just toggle. I have no loyalty. They both cancel, like, unexpectedly. They both, I mean... They're also not much cheaper than a taxi. Now, that could be, I, I'm, I'm assuming, fees and taxes. Right, right, but, right. Well, but this has more to do with the food yeah. delivery than it does yeah. the actual, at least this particular aspect of it. But I'm yes. sure there are knock-on effects. I mean, that's always the argument against raising minimum wages, there are knock-on effects. Mm. But I think we'll need a little time to see how it actually plays out. All right, keep to watching. Well, here's what to watch for tomorrow, Tuesday, December 19th, on the economic front. We'll get housing starts in the morning for the month of November. The street estimating a slight decrease from the prior months. Building permits data also coming out tomorrow morning and expected to dip. Mortgage rates have been on the decline of late, we know, currently sitting at 6.95% for the 30 year fixed rate mortgage. And some Fed speak as well. Richmond Fed CEO Thomas Barkin is speaking to. Yahoo Finance's own Jennifer Schonberger on Yahoo Finance Live. That's at 9.30 a.m. Eastern. And Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic also speaking tomorrow morning. Meanwhile, on the earnings front, FedEx reporting second quarter earnings after the bell. Earnings are expected to rise from a year ago, but the consensus is that revenue will be down from last year. Well, that does it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. Have a great night.